Hello everybody. In this lecture, we consider tensor products. Tensor products is a very important object in order to define convolutions. So um, let's uh, let's do tensor product first, and next time we're going to consider convolutions. So the first thing I want to do is a bunch of approximation results, uh, which are uh, interesting on its own. Uh, so very first one, lemma. 9.1 and uh, corollary, its corollary, uh, say gives actually a, a rate of convergence for the um, Riemann sum approximation of an integral. So um, let's start with the the first lemma. So this this lemma says that uh, the uh, if we sum here, if we take the sum. Uh, over all the lattice point, and we consider only those uh, squares, uh, this little uh, cube, uh, the integral of the, the, the function, actually the increment of the function, we integrate that on the all the cube indexed by the lattice point, then this quantity is bounded from above by the integral on Rd of a certain partial derivative of the function f. Uh, this partial derivative, there are, this sum contains 2 to the d minus 1 terms, OK? Um, all right, so uh, the, the simplest case is when d is equal to 1. So in one dimension, then the right-hand side is just the one derivative. And the sum, there's only one term. And the left-hand side is just the sum over all the, in the, the, the integers. The, um, yeah, the integers. So let's do this simple case. So when d is equal to 1, OK, so this is our um, proof of lemma. 9.1. Um, so we consider the case d equals to 1. So in that case, we assume that f is c1, and the left-hand side becomes k belonging to z and l, l plus 1. Then we compute the increment, x minus f of l. Um, yeah, by l, I, I mean k. Right? So index by k, k, k plus 1, k, dx. All right, so each one of the term, actually, so I'm going to bond from above. I'm going to use. Um, um, a uh, integral representation for the inside so from k to x of f prime of t dt dx okay so here i use the taylor expansion for the function f around the point k so uh, we can interchange the order of integration so that we obtain um, now still k line to z, uh, now k, k plus 1, full t, and x is um, it's larger than t, so it's going to be t, uh, k plus 1, uh, dx, right? f prime of t, dx dt. All right, since this interval actually has length less than 1, we have the upper bound that we wanted. K, K plus 1, F prime of T. T. I just finished the proof in the, in the case where dimension is equal to 1. So let's consider a more general case. Uh, suppose that D is now equals to 2 and uh, that the inequality, suppose uh, the inequality holds with uh, with d minus 1. So in this case, uh, we're going to argue that the formula also holds uh, for d right, in d dimension. So we consider the following quantity. So k in the lattice uh, zd, lattice point. And then we take an integral on the, uh, on the, the cube, hypercube, indexed by um, the lattice point k and fx minus f of k dx and um, uh, so here I'm going to uh, split so use the, the um, um, another representation for, for k 
So K is a lattice point in D dimensional lattice point can be always written as um, the uh, a pair and uh, the a pair of uh, of lattice point and the first lattice point that I call uh, L will be uh, an integer. So it's just on the one dimensional lattice. And a second index, I'm going to call it k prime. It is a d dimension d minus one dimensional lattice. So any k can be written as the pair l k prime. So uh, I also do um, Fubini so that the integral actually becomes l l plus one. It's a double integral. Uh, then uh, k prime. So this is uh, d minus one dimensional uh, cube times uh, now f of I use a um, I, I'm going to call x for any x I'm going to write this right x is equal to t z and uh, for any k I write l uh, k prime this is uh, my uh, notation so here I got z minus f of uh, l k prime so this is what I, I I just rewrite what we what we have on the left hand side uh, nothing really. Uh, dz dt. Okay, so this is the first line, and uh, uh, so in order to to proceed, we we would like to use our assumption on the so our assumption that this inequality holds uh, with d minus one. Also, we already proved that it holds in d equals to one. So for that uh, for that matter, we can use uh, uh, actually the the triangle inequality. Uh, so we're going to say that this guy is bounded by. So let me just use another color, write it out explicitly. So uh, this 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 thing over here is bounded by f of t z minus. So I'm going to write it uh, as f of l z. Okay, z is keep. And uh, on the other hand, I'm going to have uh, l z minus f l k prime. Okay, and for uh, each of these two terms, I'm going to apply our assumption of the hypothesis, our this uh, reduction uh, induction hypothesis, and uh, the, the case d equals to one. Right. So more precisely, we have we have two things. We have if we take the sum over l, and we compute l l plus one, then um, f of t z minus f of l z. So this is the first term that we have in the triangle inequality. And if we apply our result for dimension one, we see that immediately this is bounded from above by integral on the whole real line, then the partial uh, t f on t z and take absolute value uh, d t. Okay. On the other hand, if we take the sum over k prime, d minus 1, then k prime plus 0, 1, d minus 1 uh, cube. Then, uh, on the other hand, so this amounts to bonding the second term in the triangle inequality, so f of uh, l k prime, d z, yes. And this is bonded by, according to our um, uh, According to our hypothesis that uh, the inequality holds with d minus 1, we have this alpha belonging to 0, 1 to the power of d minus 1, alpha different from 0. And uh, we have this integral on r d minus 1. And here I should take the partial uh, partial alpha uh, on actually on z variable, of course. Um, uh, so here I'm going to have f of uh, L doesn't change, then z, and take absolute value, then dz. All right. So these are the two inequalities that we have. If you take a sum over um, L or over k prime, so we, we do that uh, differently for these two, two, two different terms. So um, by using these two things, then we can proceed. We can proceed. Let's, uh, let's just uh, call this guy. Um, let's just this call this guy star equation. So this whole thing is called star here. 
and uh, let's proceed. I'll recall that we have this uh, uh, already done. Uh, uh, we have already done that uh, this uh, upper bound for each of the terms in triangle inequality. We just use it by using the first one. We can have this uh, k z d minus one, then uh, k plus zero one k prime uh, d minus one. Then we have already obtained this partial t f z dt right so this is what we uh, what we have recorded okay so, so r then now uh, dz so this uh, we have a uh we have a double integrals okay i forgot to write uh, a t in here doesn't matter but uh, let's just write it uh okay on the other hand yes exactly so um so this is the first term we have and uh, the second term in the uh, in the triangle inequality is uh, is given by a sum over L, right? So because we have already uh, sum out the uh, the k prime variable, there remains only the sum over L. Uh, so here, like this, then um, we have um, we have obtained a, a sum over alpha, alpha belonging to zero one d minus one, then. Uh, an integral, uh, so this time L, L plus 1, and inside I have this R D minus 1. Uh, it's, a, it's a partial alpha uh, on Z variable F function, then L uh, Z, yes. Uh, this is what we have. Uh, D, Z, DT. Okay. Um, so this is precisely what we obtained uh, by using these two inequalities and uh, and this and this expression in here, okay? And so I, I left a, bl a blank place uh, for this because uh, we do not have a we do not have a formula for this kind of uh, uh, control for this kind of quantity. Uh, in order to make use of our our um, uh, in other words, uh, in our our hypothesis, not hypothesis, the, the dimension one result. Here we have only one dimension, sum over L in, okay, it's a typo, it's just Z, uh, sum in L, uh, integers, and integral L, L plus one, and uh, DT, right? But there's no T inside, so that's the, uh, that's the downside. And also we don't have a, we need to subtract something in order to, to make use of that one dimensional result. That's why I left a, a blank in here. So I'm going to add and subtract uh, something so that we can make use of that, that result, Tz. So that's the thing we add and subtract. Alpha, Z, F, Tz. Exactly. So now uh, we proceed by using a, a triangle inequality. Right, for this uh, for this term, so this minus that plus uh, the absolute value of this guy, and uh, the first guy we can make use the uh, uh, the the one dimensional result. So uh, let me just to proceed. So I'm gonna have the first lay. I have uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, simplify this this term. We realize that it's there's there's no k prime inside this this guy doesn't depend on k so if we integrate sum over all the lattice point then the cube index by lattice point we we recover the whole r d actually so the first term is easy so r d minus one r then t z t z integral d t d z so this is the this is the first term. And uh, for the second term, uh, second term, uh, I'm going to use the um, uh, so what what we have um, in the uh, in a one-dimensional result. So in other words, we are going to have just to pull out this this is alpha thing, and then we take the sum over L, right? So this is then this is bounded by a real integral and uh, R d minus one. And then we take the partial t, right, for that thing. F, then I have t, z, absolute value dt, not dz, dt. 
and the last term is given by so the same thing actually so I'm just writing here now I obtain precisely the the same thing uh, but uh, for uh, for different integral right so there's only uh, integral on uh, here so uh, integral on R because we have the sum over L L uh, integral from L to L plus one of a function which does not depend on T does not depend on L so we recover the whole real line and same here and there's no partial derivative uh, so here's Z yes uh, there's no partial T there's only partial Z alpha Z uh, F T Z D Z D T okay all good so three terms and uh, so now we can actually write it uh, as uh, uh, as what we want uh, because uh, let me just sort of give the uh, the conclusion conclusion is that the three sums actually give rise to a has a compact form it's like we take the partial alpha derivative alpha in zero one to the d not zero and we take the rd integral of our d alpha f And this is exactly what we wanted proof in the in d, d dimension. So this finished the proof. And just to stress how we obtain this identity. So we actually uh, distinguish two cases. So whenever uh, this alpha alpha is a, is a d tuple. So whenever uh, the first component, which is the t variable, is equal to one. Right. So then, uh, so there are only two cases. Whether either uh, the t component on uh, of the of the of this vector alpha is equal to zero, which corresponds to uh, which uh, t component is equal to zero, um, which corresponds to to this integral actually. So there's no t component, there's no derivative with respect to t component, right? And uh, since alpha is different from zero, it is uh, the, the requirement is satisfied. Uh, so on the other hand, t uh, the the t component of the alpha vector is equal to one. Right. So the other case is when your t components of the alpha vector is equal to one. So we have a directive on the t variable. Here it is, and also here it is. Right. And uh, since there's a component on t variable. Um, Alpha is already different from uh, uh, is already different from uh, uh, from zero. Uh, so uh, so the sub two, the sub case are uh, when we have a t uh, we have a t derivative we don't have at all any other derivatives on z variable or we have some other derivative on the z variable. Right. So we're combining all the three all the all these uh, uh, three uh, three cases. Actually, two cases and one of case has two subcases. Combining them together, we have precisely what we want to show in d dimension, and this is the uh, the proof of the first lemma. All right, so the lemma itself uh, says uh, pretty much uh, uh, not much actually, but uh, if we take a scaling, and uh, uh, we're going to see that it actually gives the rate of convergence for the Riemann sum approximation of the integral. So uh, let's do the, the second thing, which is uh, uh, what I just said. So the corollary 9.2. OK. So what we do is to apply previous lemma to this function x map to delta x we have on the one hand integral of delta x dx minus um, so I'm gonna uh, use k lattice point f of delta k So if we make use of the triangle inequality, so we see that um, uh, 
we see that this uh, so we, we can actually we, we do we cut this this integral into small pieces indexed by this uh, uh, lattice point k so we can put things together each of the small piece to obtain this so something that we know first step is just a um, rearrangement of the terms so we do have this term that looks like uh, what we have in lemma 9.1. So here I got f delta x dx minus uh, minus, uh, uh, let me say, let me just put them together. So it is going to be minus f of delta k dx. Okay, so the first step is just rearrange terms. Now we apply that lemma, so which says that it's bounded from above by alpha in 0, 1 to the power t, alpha different from 0. And then we take the integral rt and the partial alpha of f of delta x dx. And since this is a partial we, uh, alpha of a composition of two functions, we can make use of chain rule to obtain uh, that this is equal to, um, this actually, so equal to, let me just replace this. Uh, so there will be additional, the point is that there will be additional delta to the, um, to the alpha norm pull out, and then we can remove the parentheses. Okay, just chain rule. Now, um, so this is useful, and if we multiply on both sides by a, uh, let's say, um, delta to the d, and making a variable change, change of variables is going to be something like uh, um, x maps to uh, x over delta. We have uh, we have what we wanted actually gives the result. Okay, so let me just recall the result says that if you consider integral of a function, we consider a, um, a Riemann sum approximation of the threshold of this uh, mesh size delta, okay, Riemann sum approximation. And the difference is bounded by this quantity. And if we assume that's d alpha for all the alpha in 0, 1 to the d are L1 function, so that these guys are all finite numbers, then this guy uh, recorded alpha is different from 0, so that this guy is of the order delta. So that's the, uh, that's the point. So approximate sum approximation um, has a rate of conversions, you know, the size of the mesh. Um, so when, when the size of the mesh go into zero, uh, so uh, we have approximation, a precise, we recover the integral. Okay. So this uh, uh, this corollary uh, is is very useful uh, because uh, of the following reason. So let's now consider a density result for um, a density result for how to say the um, uh, for for test function on the product space. Okay, so we are going to find um, tensor products, a linear combination of tensor products of test functions on uh, individual spaces, and, uh, and that kind of thing can approximate uh, any an arbitrary test function on the product space. Okay, so here's the setup. So we have omega 1s in a subset, open subset of RP, omega 2 open subset of RQ. So P and Q are arbitrary positive integers. And uh, uh, we're going to call this T as a, a space of the space of linear combinations of the tensor products of functions in d omega 1, d omega 2, okay, tensor product. So then we can show that uh, there exists a sequence in T such that phi j converges to any phi. 
for any phi, we can find a sequence in T such that we have a good approximation result. It eventually converges to phi in the in the uh, test the space of test function on the product space. Okay, so let's do the proof. Proposition nine point three. Okay. So uh, for any phi, okay, consider omega one, omega two. Uh, we are going to define a sort of a family of auxiliary. Um, Random variables, uh, no, uh, not random variables. I mean uh, uh, functions. So this guy is uh, so first approximation will be a, a convolution type approximation. So we are going to integrate on the uh, y variable. Y variable there are q components. Uh, so phi of x z rho of uh, say rho epsilon. Rho is approximation of identity. D Z. Okay. With uh, rho in um, rho will be uh, so the y variable the omega two. Integral of rho is equal to one and uh, rho epsilon. Rho epsilon is given by uh, rho epsilon is given by one over epsilon to the d rho x over epsilon. Okay, so this is our um, approximation of identity. So this we know that this actually uh, goes to phi if epsilon goes to zero. On the other hand, we also introduce a um, um, another family x y. So this will be called delta q, uh, the delta to the q sum k z q and phi of x k delta rho epsilon k delta minus y. Uh, here the point is that um, so the basic idea is that this phi we know this is very close to phi epsilon if epsilon is small. On the other hand, from our previous uh, corollary 9.2, we know that this integral this integral can be approximated fairly well if by a Riemann sum in here if delta is chosen to be quite small. So uh, this is the chain of uh, idea that we have. So each of this phi is, is uh, phi is, is well approximated by phi epsilon with epsilon small and phi epsilon is well approximated by phi epsilon delta if delta is small. Look at the, what is uh, uh, this phi epsilon delta. It is actually a finite sum here because phi it has compact support. So it is really a finite sum. So it is indeed a linear combination of the tensor product of functions. This is a function of x variable, this is a function of variable. variables. So we have a separation of variables, tensor product of two smooth functions, two test functions on d omega 1, d omega 2. So this is what we want to show, actually. OK, so in order to do this, we need to have some precise estimate. So the first thing is simple. For any alpha, so alpha will be a multi-index. So this time I'm going to write it more explicitly. I'm going to call it alpha one, alpha two. Alpha one belongs to n to the p. Alpha two belongs to n to the q. And uh, uh, so, so what we know is that if we compute d alpha phi epsilon minus d alpha phi, this converges to zero. Now, this is something that we already know. Uh, it's very easy to compute. Um, so that, uh, uh, so the first approximation is, uh, will be good if as long as epsilon is small. So for each epsilon, I want to 
also have an estimate between uh, the distance between these two guys. I want to have an explicit estimate for the error term. So I also need to compute the following. So the alpha 1, so this is on the x variable, alpha 2 is on the y variable. And for this function, it's shown x and y, right? And uh, minus dx alpha, dy1 alpha 2, uh, phi epsilon delta x, y. So this is what we want to bond. I want to bond this quantity uniformly. I want to show that this uniformly goes to zero if epsilon if delta is, uh, is, is uh, going to zero uh, with, uh, with explicit rate. So this guy is bonded by, first of all, we can make use of our uh, uh, corollary because each one of the term is written as an integral. For instance, this guy, we look at what it is, it's, it's an integral. And if we take the, the partial uh, derivative with respect to x and with respect to y, we just uh, pass it, which can interchange it because of the, uh, the nice property of the function phi and the row. We can interchange the order of integration and, and derivative. So that uh, this guy is an integral. And this guy also, uh, is uh, can be written as an integral, right? Uh, so it is actually so this guy is a sum is a is a Riemann sum that we have. We approximate the integral by a Riemann sum. So here we just uh, take the derivative with x variable and y variable. We have precisely matching terms, just like that. And uh, um, so by using the, the corollary, we have the upper bound. So sum, uh, let me call it a beta in 0, 1 to the uh, q. Beta is different from 0. And we got integral r q. So this time a partial, uh, it's going to be partial beta z of the product. Uh, so so uh, alpha 1, phi x variable, right? So they have y variable, so which act only on the row function. This time k, now wait a minute, there's no k, just z. Uh, and uh, here we got a y. Here we go. Okay, so this step we just apply the corollary. So now uh, we can actually we can we can call it. So first uh, we got I forgot to write this row to the q, which is uh, row to the beta. Uh, okay, so uh, so this uh, uh, delta to the to the beta norm thing is bounded by delta. Right? Delta is small, so uh, the largest term is delta. And the rest of them, I'm going to call that, call that thing uh, a quantity A uh, alpha epsilon, which depends on the value of phi, and a function phi, where I'm just write it out. So A alpha epsilon phi is precisely uh, the supremum over all the x and y variable. And integral R Q, and uh, I'm gonna have um, this guy. Uh, so actually, I forgot to write a uh, sum. Uh, have sum beta um, in zero one to the d beta different from zero, and now we take the integral R Q. And uh, um, dz beta, so I just copy paste. Here I got this, and this product, right? So dz, all right. So I just bond everything by its supremum, okay? So uh, we notice that uh, this quantity A is finite for any chosen if shown okay we haven't to take a limit yet uh, so uh, this guy will be a finite quantity and it depends only on if shown a and alpha 
also the function phi, of course. Everything depends on function phi. So uh, this quantity is finite for any fixed epsilon. So what we do is to choose epsilon going to zero, such that this quantity is small. And we choose delta. We first choose epsilon so that this guy is small. Then we choose delta such that the product is small. OK, so combining these two, we are going to finish the proof. Now let's uh, just write, it, write things out. Uh, so we choose epsilon j and delta j going to zero in such a way that uh, delta j times this uh, supremum alpha less than or equal to j and uh, a alpha uh, here got epsilon j phi go to zero. So this is the this is the goal. So we uh, we we um, require a little bit more than what I just said. So we also require that delta j uh, is small in such a way that this the guy times the supremum of this alpha this a alpha epsilon quantity for all the alpha less than or equal to j. Okay. So the reason is that uh, at such we can control all the alphas. Okay, for all the fixed alpha, eventually our uh, the function, as long as j gets larger, so let me just write, then uh, for j large, by that I mean j larger than equal to alpha, for any fixed alpha, I have for all the j large that d alpha phi epsilon j minus d alpha phi epsilon j delta j, the supremum now is bounded by delta j, this uh, uh, now supremum uh, of uh, alpha, uh, alpha less than equal to j, then a alpha epsilon j phi. The sky goes to zero. Okay, by combining these two facts, we are finished. Okay, so um, so what we have just proved is that uh, we can find a dense subset, which are uh, which you can find a dense uh, subset, which are linear combinations, finite linear combinations of tensor product functions in the space of test functions on the product space. Okay. All right. So now we move on to the definition of tensor product of uh, two distributions. So uh, let me just start with a small motivation. So how we define a, uh, um, a tensor product actually is motivated from our the known stuff from a uh, function setup. So we consider f and g uh, smooth functions. So a tensor product, we know how to define it. And we apply it to a test function. That is what we have. And uh, so uh, naturally, if we uh, write, this, write things out using Fubini, and we can first integrate gy phi of xy dy, then we take the integral with rec to dx uh, times fx. And this is nothing but in terms of a, a distribution language. So t associated with f applied to a function which is the here, this function, test function. But this text function also can be written as the t of g applied to phi of x, y. So here I need to be uh, more precise. So g act on the second variable, and the x, f act on the first variable. So this is what I have. And let's look at uh, how we define a, uh, a distribution, a tensor product distribution. We do exactly the same thing. So what we do is to first apply t2 to the function on the product space. t2 is a distribution on the second variable, okay, on the y variable. We apply this to the second variable as this function. We obtain a function of the first variable, rho x. And, um, and then uh, for this function, we apply t1, right? t1 applied to this function. So in order to make sense of this right-hand side, we need to guarantee that this rho function is a test function. But this is clearly true because we have um, we got because of the uh, we have this uh, shown that we can differentiate under the under the bracket. 
sign. Right? So, uh, uh, so a previous result says that this guy is C infinity is compact support. Okay, so that this guy is a test function, and this right hand side makes sense. All right, so this is precisely what we have, which coincide with uh, what we can get for L1 log function. So here is a small calculation for that. Um, of course, we need to do the localization for all the compact sets, etc. But never mind. So we have uh, precisely an extension of what we can do for L1 log function, and this uh, actually turns out to be uh, to to hold in general. So. By that, I mean this guy, uh, indeed, this, this is, is clear a linear form, right? So this linear form is continuous so that it defines a distribution. And this is the content of Proposition 9.5. And just quickly check this fact. It's, a, it's a really uh, not hard to check. Uh, so Proposition 9.5, we are going to check that we, the, the tensor product we just defined is a distribution. So first, uh, for any k1, a compact subset of omega 1, uh, k2, a compact subset of omega 2, uh, we know that there exists a c1, c2, m1, m2 that corresponds to uh, the t1 distribution and t2 distribution, okay, the constant, and the order of the, the, uh, the, the derivative needed such that, so let's just consider this uh, for any, so of course I need to consider a, a test function, so any test function phi d omega 1 omega 2 with the support of phi including k1 times k2 the product space, uh, we have that, we have this, uh, this row Right, so rho is what we define in here in the definition. So rho we obtain it by applying t2 to the y variable of the phi function. So uh, this rho we know is be, is indeed in the uh, omega, as I just said, it's indeed the omega 1, right, first variable, uh, with compact support. And clearly this is the support of... Uh, of rho is including k1, according to the definition, so that t tensor product s applied to phi, so we want to have a bond for this guy, right? In order to show that it's a distribution, it remains to have an upper bound. Constant times uh, supremum norm of partial derivatives. So uh, first, it is actually written as, uh, okay, it's not a t s, it's, uh, it's called t1, t2, just write t1, t2. Okay, so first it is written as is T1 and uh, apply to apply to rho. This is the definition. Uh, so that we know it's bounded from above by this constant C1, the supremum of this alpha less than or equal to M1, and we take the partial alpha rho, then uh, supremum norm. Uh, okay. Also, uh, recall that rho is again rho is t2 applied to the y variable of this phi function, and if we take the partial rho, we can pass it inside the the, the, the bracket. So we get t2 applied to partial uh, alpha phi. So this is what we uh, have. Just using a, a known fact. So C1 supremum alpha less than or equal to M1, then now we have uh, T2 applied to the alpha phi x variable, x. This is what we have by the definition of rho. Then uh, by using the fact that T2 is a distribution, we have C1 times C2. Supremum alpha less than or equal to m1, supremum beta less than or equal to m2, then I have this beta on the, um, so beta is on the y variable, and uh, 
alpha is on the x variable, phi of x, y. This is what we have. Just forget about this. All right. So uh, this is bounded by C1, C2, then supreme of over alpha less than or equal to M1 plus M2, then uh, D alpha phi. So this shows that a distribution, T1, T2 is a distribution as desired. And this concludes the proof. All right. Um, let's uh, uh, see one example. Example 9.6. So first example is simple. We just consider a tensor product to direct masses. So I should have uh, this T, uh, this delta A tensor delta B and phi, where A belongs to R, P, B belongs to R, Q. Apply to a test function. So according to the definition, I should have uh, this delta A, then phi, okay, on the, recall that this is defined as this guy, apply to this guy applied to the second variable, which is a phi of b, okay? And then uh, delta gives a b, which is nothing but a b applied to phi, okay? So this shows that this guy, tensor product, is equal to a direct mass, again, on the pair of point, which belongs to r p plus q. Okay, so on the other hand, if we consider a delta A tensor S, which S is a distribution on phi uh, omega 2, then I should have uh, the following. So it's going to be delta A applied to rho. Okay? Rho is what we obtain by applying S to the second variable of phi. And this gives us a rho of A, and the recorded rho is just the S applied to the second variable of phi. Right, so uh, it's actually so second variable. This is it, and this uh, this finished the uh, uh, the exercise. Okay, so now we move on to some basic properties about tensor product, and then the first thing is a categorizing property of the tensor product, and this actually makes sense, right? So when we apply a tensor product to a tensor product, and then we just apply, uh, uh, then what we have should be the product of the action of T1 on phi1 and ac action of T2 on phi2, okay? So uh, the proof of this proposition 9.2, 9.7, So we know that T defined as T1 tensor T2, uh, so defines, satisfies that property. This is a clear. Satisfies the property, okay? Because T2 applied to the second variable of the tensor product is just the T2 applied to phi2, okay? And um, and then with T1 applied to a constant times phi1 is equal to that constant times T applied to T1, uh, to, 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 uh, to that phi1. So we do have that property. Uh, assume that there is another one. So let's show the uniqueness. Uh, T tilde also satisfied the property. Then we computed the, the difference any phi in the test function, omega one, omega two. Uh, we know that there exists a phi j converts to phi in d omega one, omega two, and that phi j, the whole family is taken from this t, which is the linear combination, which is a linear, a finite linear combination of tensor product functions in d omega one and d omega two. 
Right. Okay, so uh, what we want to do now is to compute the difference of t and t tilde applied to phi. And this, according to the continuity, we know that j goes to infinity, t, t, infinity, delta, phi, j. And then uh, for each of this kind of function, we know that both functions satisfy this property, so they coincide. Okay, Pro some tensor product. So uh, we have to, so actually each of the term uh, equals, each of the term equal equals zero, so the limit is zero. Finish the proof. So this is a characterizing uh, property. So now we consider a corollary. From this characterization, we can show immediately that uh, uh, the kind of Fubini theorem. So first we integrate uh, the y variable or uh, then x variable, or we first integrate the, 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 the X variable then Y variable. Um, we have obtained we obtain the same thing, so Fubini type uh, thing. So for any phi one omega one and phi two omega two, that's function. Uh, we have we should have this. Uh, uh, Theta equals to T one phi one two and this T two apply to theta is equal to uh, T two apply to T one phi one then phi two which is nothing but T1 phi 1, T2 phi 2. Okay, so you, in other words, um, uh, this also satisfy this. Uh, so what we adjust the set, this guy on the on the right hand side, this also define satisfy the, uh, this uh, um, characterizing property in proposition 9.7. So uh, since there's uniqueness, so has to be the, the tensor product. The result follows by the uniqueness. Uniqueness part of the proposition, 9.7. The proof is done. Okay, uh, just a little bit of caveat. So what do we just show this Fubini type uh, uh, result? Which says that uh, this guy is either uh, is equal to t1 applied to rho. Rho is when we apply t2 to the second variable, and it is also equal to t2 applied to theta, where theta is when we apply t1 to the first variable. Okay, it's a Fubini type argument. It does not say it, it does not say anything like interchangeability or commutativity of the tensor product, right? So this is clearly not true, actually, uh, because of the following. Let me just give a, a simple example. So this caveat. Uh, so uh, we don't have this uh, commutativity for tensor product because uh, let me just uh, say a very simple example. F is x function and the g is a it's a square function. So then f tensor g is equal to x y square, which is different from x square y, but this guy is equal to g tensor f. So we don't have the commutativity for uh, tensor product as zero. This is the classical case, actually. And in general, it doesn't hold either. All right, so let's move on to uh, other properties, like support, derivatives, and continuity. So first thing, support. Um, so we want to show that support of tensor product is equal to the product of the of the support. So uh, we take one point in the from the left hand side, t 
T1 tensor T2. Since it is in the support of a distribution, we know that that there, uh, for any for any R positive, we can find a, a test function on the product space B R x1. So x will be written as s1 x2 naturally. So x1, this, this is the ball centered at x1 with the radius r times the ball centered at x2 with radius r. So for any r, um, so this is kind of a rectangle right, on the product space. We can find a, a neighborhood, which is a rectangle, uh, such that t, this tensor product Y is different from zero. Okay. By the density result, there exists by one the x one by two the phi r uh, b r x two such that. Um, T1 tensor T2, phi1 tensor phi2 is different from zero. Okay, and uh, this is the same as saying that T1 applied to phi1 is different from zero, and T2 applied to phi2 is different from zero. So from here, we infer that x1 is in the support of t1 and x2 is in the support of t2. Hence, the pair belongs to the product of the two sets. OK, so this shows the inclusion part. So we take any point in the support of the tensor product, we have shown that this point belongs to the product of the support. So uh, we can actually revert every step. So if we take one point from here, then necessarily for any r, we can find a function phi1, a test function, and a function phi2, a test function on, uh, on the second box. Uh, such that this 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 uh, this property is true. So if this is true, then this is this is true, okay. And this is a specific uh, test function, so that uh, we have this. And uh, for any R, this guy this this kind of property holds, which means that X is is uh, is in the support of tensor product. We can revert every step to have uh, the equivalence. Let us finish the proof. OK, so uh, next thing is about the, de the derivative. So the derivative, uh, we may, there are two cases. So when j is less than or equal to p, we call it p is the dimension of the first variable. Okay, Omega 1 is a subset of rp, and omega 2 is a subset of rq. So when j, so we take the derivative with respect to the one of the first uh, p variables, so those axes, uh, then uh, we, it is a tensor product of the derivative on the first on the on the first distribution t1, tensor product with t2, and uh, similarly for the for the for the other case. Okay, so for any j larger than p, t1 apply to j phi. Um, Okay. Let's consider the let's consider the simple case. The okay, the case where uh, j is less than or equal to p. So if j is less than or equal to p, then we know that uh, this t two apply to j phi of x is j t two um, phi of X. Okay, so this uh, 
we make use of the known result that we can differentiate uh, under the bracket sign. And this is nothing but j theta. So this function that we define in the definition. Okay. Uh, okay, so theta is the, uh, okay, we actually call it the row in the, in the definition, but never mind. Uh, here we got this. Anyway, uh, this guy, this, uh, this bracket is defined to be theta. Okay, so uh, all that is to show that DJ tensor product applied to a generic test function, quantity definition, it is equal to TJ tensor T1, T2, then DJ. And um, we know uh, that according to the definition, uh, this guy is equal to T1 applied to uh, T1 applied to this quantity. Right? This is what we have. T1 applied to this quantity, which is equal to dj, dj theta. So it is equal to negative T1 uh, dj theta. And by making use of the definition of uh, derivative, we have this, okay? But this is nothing but uh, dj t1 tensor t2 applied to phi. And this is precisely what we want to show. And the other case, follows uh, immediately with the same argument, okay? We all made the proof. All right, so uh, support is studied and derivative. We know the now continuity. So continuity property uh, is quite interesting. It says that if you have a sequence Tn converging to T in the space of distribution of omega 1, another sequence Sn converging to S in the space of the distributions on omega 2, then the tensor product also converge to uh, also converges to uh, T tensor S. Okay, let's uh, uh, do the proof. For the continuity. Uh, first, let me recall a, a known fact. Recall that by the uh, uniform bondingness principle, Alaban Eckstein House, we have that. If Tn converge to T in the space of distributions and phi n converges to phi in the space of test functions, then Tn phi n converge to T phi. Hence, another way to, to formulate it is that uh, this bracket is bicontinuous. Okay, it's continuous on both of its arguments. And this is a very important fact, and we're going to make use of it to prove its continuity. And it's going to be uh, fairly simple once we know this fact. OK. Uh, so in order that, in order to show uh, this, this uh, Tn, Sn, phi, which is Recall that this is nothing but Tn applied to Sn applied to the y variable. So for x, y variable. This guy, let me just call it uh, rho x, defined to be rho x. Uh, it depends on n as well. And uh, um, 
uh, we want to show that this guy converts to actually T S by X. This guy we call it the row of X. Okay, so these are the uh, according to the definition of uh, of tensor product, this is nothing but T tensor S applied to phi. Okay. So we want to show that this guy converts to this guy, which is nothing but this guy converts to this guy. And uh, we are in the framework of applying this by continuity of the bracket. So in order to show this convergence, all that we need to do is to show row n converges to row in the space of test functions, because by definition, no, by hypothesis, t n already converges to t. Okay. So it remains to to show that row n that I just defined converts to row in the space of test functions, and it's omega one. Um, so, uh, we notice that for any Xn converging to X in the compact set K1, of course, we have chosen a compact set at the very beginning, um, then the, the, then the test function, right? So for any X, Xn converging to, uh, X in K1, we have Uh, this guy, alpha, any alpha in D um, X variable. So uh, X variable, so it's P, yes. Uh, okay, so D alpha rho N. So I'm just consider phi N, X N as a function. Actually, actually converges to d alpha phi x as a function in d omega two. It's a function of the y variable uh, indexed by x n. So this is true because of the uh, uh, it's, a, it's a simple reason that uh, this function. So if we take the partial uh, derivative with respect to the y variable and we want to control the uniform norm of this difference, then uh, we end up using a mean value theorem to bond everything by a constant times xn minus x. And since xn go into x, we know that this guy goes to zero for any beta. So this shows the convergence in d omega 2, actually. So uh, once we have that, we show we have so uh, we can apply this to uh, again we can apply this by continuity of the bracket to show that rho n converges to rho n x n converts to rho x. This guy go to zero because okay? because this guy uh, with uh, with x n converts to this guy with an x, right? And this, the, the result will follow. And we're done. OK, so the, the key property is really the back continuity of this, uh, of the bracket that we have, sh we have, uh, we have in the show, right? So we just uh, record it. Uh, we have this unifund bonus principle for a Van Eckstein house, uh, a la Van Eckstein house. Then by using this property, we can uh, we can derive this property fairly easily. But this is a quite deep result that we didn't show. Okay, uh, so the final thing I want to do is an application of the tensor product. So uh, the the most important application of tensor of tensor products actually the definition of convolution. But uh, uh, we're going to do that next time. So here I just mentioned. One application, which one application, which is related to what we did before, on the null space of multiplication by linear functions and uh, the null space of 
of taking a derivative. Okay, so let's do the proof. Proof of proposition uh, is 9.12. Uh, so first property is the null space of a multiplication. So we consider any phi, which is a test function, Okay, let me just recall first the what we what we want to show. Uh, so we have shown that if t times x minus x i minus a i for all the a all the a i's all the variables all the all the i in uh, i in in uh, in one two d. So d is the dimension of the of the of the distribution here. D is equal to p plus q. Okay. If this is true for all the i in 1, 2, d, then necessarily t is a uh, is a direct mass on the point a, a corresponding to the vector a1, a2, a d. Here we say that we can actually extend it in the sense that we can uh, maybe uh, t maybe what we just maybe this probably holds only for a certain variables of the distribution. Not all of them, right? So, for instance, it only holds for the first p variables. Then we can still say say something meaningful about the distribution, and this will be uh, the distribution will be a tensor product of a direct mass with another distribution. Okay, this makes sense. Uh, on the other hand, for the derivative, we have the same kind of phenomena. So, if we don't have the partial, we don't have this kind of properties. Partial j is equal to zero for all the j in 1, 2, p plus q. We don't have that. We have only this property for the first p variables. Then we can still say something meaningful about the structure of t. And this t will be a constant function tensored with another distribution. So let's show the first property. The proof is almost identical with what we did before, just a slight adapt, uh, adapted. So we consider a test function with uh, support in some uh, with supporting some k, some k1, k2 that we choose at the very beginning. And we also consider a test function chi, which is a cutoff function on the which variable, k, first variable. Uh, cutoff function chi is equal to 1 on k1. One. So that t applied to phi, okay, according to, uh, so we make a decomposition actually. So in order to show that we have a direct mass tensor product uh, with, with a distribution, we are going to make that uh, direct mass explicit, right? So we're going to write phi of a, y variable times a chi of x variable. Uh, so the advantage of writing this, so let me just finish first the, the decomposition, phi minus the same. The advantage of writing such a decomposition is that this guy uh, will produce a term t applied to uh, the t uh, uh, will produce a term and that is uh, a certain distribution applied to this variable. Okay, so we apply we you make use of a Fubini type argument. Um, a certain distribution which is obtained by applying t to uh, chi tensor with another function. Okay. Um, and on the other hand, this guy, since it satisfied a property that phi of a, uh, phi of uh, a y is equal to zero, we can by according to the Hadamard lemma, we can find a function, we can find a, a bunch of uh, smooth functions such that uh, this guy can be written as the product of a linear function times a smooth function. Okay, and then we can make use of the hypothesis and say that this second term doesn't matter. Okay, so this is uh, the plan. Uh, first, according to the Hadamard lemma. Uh, this guy, just give it a name, 
and it clearly says find a product of phi of a y is equal to zero, where a is just a one a p. Okay, and by Hadama, that we uh, used several times, there exists phi function phi j or phi i in the test function on the product space, such that phi of x and y is equal to i from 1 to p, then x i minus a i times uh, phi i of x y. Okay. Hence, we make use of our assumption on the on the fact that uh, t times this linear function is equal to zero. We know the second term doesn't matter, and we have t times uh, t applied to phi is equal to the first term only a y chi x, and then we're going to have this. Uh, let me define this s uh, to be um, S of any uh, test function rho will be defined to be t applied to chi tensor rho. So that uh, according to this definition, so here this formula is nothing but uh, so t applied to the first variable uh, tensor rho is phi, right? So this guy is phi of a. So what do we have? And this is nothing but delta A. This is something that we have checked already in our print example. And recall that this is exactly what we want to show. So delta A tensor S is equal to T. This is our conclusion. And uh, here, uh, this S is defined as this linear form, and this clearly is a uh, distribution. So we can check by using the fact that t is a distribution. So s is also a distribution. It's a distribution on the fact on the on the set uh, as a distribution on the second variable omega 2. Okay so this finished the proof. We have shown that t is equal to delta a tensor s. And the second thing also, uh, uh, the proof is quite similar to the classical situation, so we only consider uh, omega 1 is I1 IP with intervals I j, j from 1 to p. The general case follows by using By the Lewin principle. Okay, so we only consider a case where omega is a is a is a box, sort of rectangle type of thing. So now we consider a generic uh, test function, any test function d omega one, omega two with the support for including k one, k two that we have chosen in the very beginning. And also we take a test function on the second variable, okay, on the first variable with the property that chi integral is equal to one. With these two in mind, so I can first write a decomposition, which is helpful. I'm gonna integrate, integrate, in, integrate out, uh, integrate out the first variable of the phi function. So I'm gonna get z, uh, y, so we obtain a, a function of y, but t applies to a function of x and y, so I still need a function of uh, the x variable. That is where uh, sky function kicks in. And of course, we need to subtract, add and subtract. Right? So this gives us a decomposition. Okay, x, all right. Uh, so the point is that it's uh, the second thing, since the integral of the second thing on the x variable is clearly equals to zero, 
we have a characteriz characterization for such a for this kind of function, right? So we know this function must be the derivative, the partial derivative, sum of partial derivative of some smooth function. Uh, so let me give this second term a name, phi x y, with the property that integral on the x variable, uh, which is on R p. the x is equal to zero. So because of this property, we have a characterization, characterization for that kind of property. We know that there exists some uh, phi j, which test function on the product space, such that is phi x y is the sum over j from one to p, then dj phi j X. And consequently, the second term is equal to zero. Right? So because T applied to this quantity is equal to zero according to the to the to the property in here. Right? Take the partial derivative with respect to T apply to phi, then we pass it to the test function, and then we have uh, 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 we have that t applied to this kind of thing is equal to zero. So it remains only one term in the decomposition is nothing but t integral r p phi of x of z and y uh, d z and chi of x. Second term disappear, and this is nothing but s applied to this function, this uh, function of uh, y, with the choice as before that s applied to rho is defined to be t applied to uh, on the second variable, so t applied to chi tensor uh, rho. So this is a distribution, which is a distribution of the second variable. Okay, and also we realize that this guy is equal to one according to the definition of uh, of tensor product. We have this applied to phi. So this shows that t is equal to one, the constant function, times uh, tensor product with a certain distribution s, which is given by this formula, and we're done. Okay, so very good. We have some uh, nice application of this uh, tensor product. A tensor product naturally appears when we want to consider the, um, the, ten the, the null space of certain operations on the space of distributions. So another uh, application of tensor product is to define convolutions, as I said already. And to see this, let me just give a small motivation, and we're going to go into more details next time. So the, the motivation for uh, defining a um, a tensor product is uh, if we consider uh, if we consider a smooth function, so S, F, and, uh, and G are all smooth function. And if we consider uh, the tensor product X and uh, phi of uh, no, no tensor product. It's just uh, uh, the the integral of us of the convolution times a smooth function. So we want to see how we can define uh, a uh, convolution for distributions. We need to we need to get some inspiration from what happens in a classical sense. Right. So this is uh, the, our idea. Uh, 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 so uh, let's just write out this this, this convolution. It's, we know what it is. It's just the integral of x, f x minus y, then g of y dy, then phi of x, dx, okay? And then we can make a variable change, right? So we want to change uh, uh, z equals to x minus y, so that so this becomes z and g of y, dy, this becomes uh, uh, z plus y, dz. So now uh, we realize that, okay, we can write it outside it. 
in y. And uh, this clearly can be written as f tensor g, right? f tensor g, then we have a function of z y, then phi of z plus y, dz dy, double integral. OK, so this shows that in order to define a convolution of distributions, the natural choice for defining such an object would be to define it as the tensor product of the distribution in here applied to a test function, but with only one variable. Okay, tensor product with one variable, which is uh, this one variable is, is given by the sum of these two variables. So somehow, uh, if we want to have a definition, we should have this kind of thing. T S then applied to phi, let's call it uh, phi delta, where phi delta of x is equal to, uh, so it's a, it's a distribution of two variables. Let me just call it uh, um, z and y. It's phi of z plus y for some phi test function on omega. Okay, so this is the natural definition. Yeah, this is precisely what we have for smooth functions. And uh, uh, so there are some subtleties in defining such a quantity because mostly because uh, the fact that this guy is not necessarily a test function. If phi in here is just a general test function, right? if it is a general test function, it is quite likely, it is possible that this, the support of this, of this function phi delta is, is unbounded. To see this, let me just give a simple example. Uh, so this guy is, we consider uh, phi, so what is my notation? Uh, okay, phi delta. Phi delta, uh, say y negative y will be equal to phi of y minus y, which is phi of zero. And this guy's different from zero. If we choose phi, if we choose a, a phi general with the property that phi zero is different from zero. So this guy is never zero. It's never zero for all the y. For all the y, okay. So all the y in R D, say, and uh, here let me just uh, uh, suppose that omega is just R D. So it's find that property. So the support is is unbounded, and uh, then uh, this guy is not well defined. So the distribution applied to this is not. Uh, we don't have a definition for that. So we need to uh, take care of this chapter this to define still, to, to be able to define a tensor product for this for convolutions. And this tends to, this uh, um, convolutions of distribution turns out to be very useful in other, um, in problems in PD. So um, we'll do that next time and uh, see you in another video.